everyone, and welcome to our At The Movie series here at Riverbank Church. My name is Rachel, and I'm so excited to be a part of this series. This is so fun. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a movie that, honestly, I cannot watch without crying. And I'm not talking about, like, the cute, single tear streaming down my face kind of crying. It's like the ugly, can't catch your breath, needing tissues, <laughs> making weird sounds kind of crying. Our movie today is The Blind Side. It's a movie based on a true story of Leanne and Sean Tui who welcome a homeless teenage boy named Michael Orr into their home. Michael doesn't know who his father is and because of addiction, his mother has abandoned him. So his life from a very young age is marked by pain and trauma. A very kind friend uh, who lets Michael sleep on his couch from time to time advocates for him to be able to attend this prestigious private school. And surprisingly, the school board agrees to admit him. And while this huge and life-changing opportunity is a blessing, Michael feels very different from everyone else there. He feels alone and very out of place. He is lost in a world that looks and feels very different from what he's used to. However, one cold and rainy night with one random act of kindness from a very determined and sassy Southern woman, Michael's life is changed forever. What is he wearing? It's freezing. What's his name again? Big Mike. Where is he going? Hey, Big Mike. Where you headed? Jim. Go ahead. Turn around. Big Mike! Stop the car. Big Mike. Hey, my name's Leanne Tui. My kids go to Wingate. You said you were going to the gym. School gym's closed. Why were you going to the gym? Big Mike, why were you going to the gym? Because it's, it's warm. Do you have any place to stay tonight? Don't you dare lie to me. Seen that look many times. She's about to get her way. Come on. Come on. SJ make room. Get inside. Come on. Where are we going? Oh. As the movie continues, we get to see Big Mike become a member of this family. It's moving and inspiring. Truthfully, anytime I see or hear a story about adoption or foster care or a story of someone else helping a child in need by welcoming them into their life and into their space, by giving them love and feeding them, helping them to rewrite a story that is very broken, I get overwhelmed. Partly because I have my own history with this. My own story includes a broken family and trauma and abuse, uh, time spent in foster care, sleeping on relatives' couches while my parents struggled with their own addictions. And I remember feeling lost and lonely and confused about why my siblings and I weren't valuable enough to fight for. But another reason I feel overwhelmed is because every time I hear a story like this, it reminds me that God does the exact same thing for us. Ephesians 1, 5 says that God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. 
This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Our adoption gives us a new family. <laughs> when we put our faith <clears throat> in Jesus, we're adopted into God's family. The Bible says he wanted to do this. He wanted us in his family. It makes him happy. It gives him pleasure that we're his children. I often wonder if we fully understand what this means. I think our lives would look very different if we could grasp what it means to be in God's family, to be chosen by him, to be his son and to be his daughter and to sit at his table. I don't think that we always walk confidently in this reality. I don't know that we understand this truth enough because as Christians, we get to call God who created this universe in seven days, who breathed life into existence, the God of miracles, the one who heals and sees all things and knows all things and is in control of all things. We get to call him father, the same God that says, you are my son, you are my daughter, you can call me father. <laughs> What's crazy to me is that it would have been amazing enough for him to provide a way of freedom for us, to send his son so that we could be forgiven. He could have stopped at just rescuing us, at sending his son Jesus to set us free. And it would have been totally amazing. And it would have blown our minds. It would have been enough. We would have been overwhelmed by his goodness and kindness, but he didn't stop there. <laughs> he's so good and he's so kind and he's so loving that he doesn't just set us free and allow us to find forgiveness. His grace goes so much further. He adopts us, he claims us, he calls us his children. He welcomes us into his family. He saw us broken and lost and standing in the cold rain. And he said, come on, get in this car. Let's go. You have a home. You have a place. You are now my child. And if you're anything like me, you long for a place to belong. You want to know that you matter and that someone would choose you, that someone would claim you. So today I want you to know that you are chosen. And you are not just chosen by anybody. You are chosen and loved and welcomed into the family of God. You have a home. You have a name. You have a purpose. You are not an accident or a mistake. You are a child of God. And with a new family comes a new name. God gives us a new name. I got clothes. You have clothes. And an extra t-shirt and a plastic bag is not a wardrobe make. I have clothes. Fine, let's go get them. Just tell me where I'm going. All right. Tell me everything I need to know about you. Who takes care of you? A mother? Do you have a mother? A grandmother, maybe? Tell you what, Big Mike, we can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way. You take your pick. Fine. Tell me just one thing I should know about you. Just, just one. I don't like to be called Big Mike. Okay. Tell you what, from now on, to me you're Michael, okay? This short clip holds so much truth. In this scene, we hear Michael say what many, if not all of us have felt. I don't like my name. <laughs> I don't like the name people call me. I don't like the name I call myself. I don't like the name I'm answering to. That's not who I am. Names are powerful, names matter, and God actually spends a lot of time in the Bible calling us by name and telling us who we are, telling us what our name is, reminding us of the names that we should answer to. Maybe he knew that we were gonna struggle with this. He knew we were gonna find ourselves answering to the wrong names, giving ourselves the wrong names, allowing other people to get our names wrong. Right now, in the world around us, there is so much focus on identity, so much focus on what we call ourselves, how we identify, how others see us. We want to know who we are. We want to discover who we are, and we want others to know who we are. 
in a way that only God can, he makes it so simple for us. He has a way of clarifying the gray and murky waters of identity. Satan is actually the author of confusion, while God is the author of peace. And God is actually very clear about who we are and what our names should be. There are too many times in our lives when we allow people and circumstances to name us. We do it to ourselves too. We look at our reflection and we give ourselves names like ugly, fat, skinny, saggy, plain, gross. We see our imperfections and we answer to them when they call to us instead of remembering the truth of what God says about us. Truth names us fearfully and wonderfully made. We sometimes let the circumstances of our lives name us. So when we are included in something and that leaves us feeling sad, we give ourselves the name left out. And when we're craving community and we're not finding it, we name ourselves lonely. When someone who should have cared for us and loved us doesn't, we answer to the name unlovable. These are in fact not our names. We may feel these things, we may experience these things, but we must never allow these things to become our names. We sometimes let our struggles and our sin name us. When we fill a need with a substance that we struggle to control, we say, hello, my name is addict. And when we can't manage to say the truth out loud, maybe it's too painful, maybe it hurts too much, we say, hey, nice to meet you, my name is liar. We begin to introduce ourselves by the sin that we find ourselves trapped in, and we believe it's who we are and all we will ever be, and that is a lie. We let our disappointments name us too. Names like not good enough, not pretty enough, not smart enough, not married enough, not chosen enough, just not enough. I want you to know that God is very clear about your name and he is very clear about my name. He is very clear about the names we should answer to. And he only wants you to answer to what he calls you. So he tells us our name, he makes it clear. In Ephesians 1, 4, he calls you chosen. In 1 Peter 2, 9, he names you royal. In 1 Corinthians 15, 57, he names you victorious. In Ephesians 1, 7, he names you forgiven. He calls you a new creature. He says you are no longer a slave to your past or to your sin. In Ephesians 2, 10, he calls you a workmanship, God's workmanship, a masterpiece. In Ephesians 1, 7, he names you redeemed. Ephesians 1, 4, he names you holy and blameless. In Romans 1, 7, he names you beloved. And in Matthew 25, 34, he calls you blessed. These are the names that we need to respond to. Your name is not the name the world calls you or what your past calls you or what your disappointment calls you or what the mirror calls back to you. Your name is the name that you answer to. And guess what? You don't have to answer to any name other than what God calls you. So if you find yourself answering to some other names, you need to remind yourself of who you are and whose you are. And if you hear someone calling you lonely, you need to say, huh, they must not be talking to me. I'm just going to keep on walking because that's not my name. And if someone calls out to you saying that you're abandoned, nope, they can't be talking about me because I'm chosen. I'm created with and for a purpose. And when the mirror tries to confuse you with names you know are not true, you need to stare back boldly and say, I am loved, I am chosen, I am forgiven, I am blessed, I am able, I am who he says I am. I am his son, I am his daughter, I am a child of God. Know your name, know what he calls you. The only need to answer to that, your name matters. God's adoption gives us a new family and it gives us a new name. And with a new family and a new name comes an inheritance. There are certain gifts and blessings that come simply by belonging to a family. And God gives us an inheritance. Over here you have a desk, a chest of drawers, you have a nightstand, a light, an alarm, 
Oh, and Sean says all the pro athletes use futons if they can't find a bed big enough, so I got you one of those. Of course, the frame was heinous. It's not about to let that in my house, but I got you something nicer. It's mine? Yes, sir. What? Never had one before. What, a room to yourself? A bed. Well, you have one now. Just like this scene with Michael receiving his own bed for the first time in his life, a gift that came simply because he was part of the family now, he didn't earn it. He didn't purchase it himself. He was given it because he was in the family. And when we are adopted into God's family, we're also given gifts. We're given an inheritance. We don't earn them. We don't deserve them. They are ours simply because we are children of God and he delights in giving them to us. Ephesians 1.3 tells us that because of our unity with Jesus, we have been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. We receive an identity that is marked by incredible privilege simply because we're adopted by God. We're in his family. Charles Spurgeon said this, Our thanks are due to God for all temporal blessings. They are more than we deserve. But our thanks ought to go to God in thunders of hallelujahs for spiritual blessings. A new heart is better than a new coat. To feed on Christ is better than to have the best earthly food. <laughs> to be an heir of God is better than being the heir of the greatest nobleman. To have God for our portion is blessed infinitely more blessed than to own broad acres of land. God hath blessed us with spiritual blessings. These are the rarest, the richest, the most enduring of all blessings. They are priceless in value. Every spiritual blessing, everything we have is from God. Everything we need, he provides, he gives us. God is a God of abundance. He doesn't withhold or keep his blessings from us. We've been given every spiritual blessing, including adoption, grace, redemption, <laughs> forgiveness, knowledge. We've been given inheritance. We have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, joy, peace, love. We have an intimate relationship with God. We are now members of the family of God, and so we share in his inheritance as children of God. He has filled us with his spirit, which means we have been given authority over everything. There is nothing, nothing that has the power to defeat us. That is our identity. That is who we are. There's so much love. There's so much grace. There's so much peace that comes with the word adoption. But there is one important truth that can't be forgotten. Adoption always begins with brokenness. Now in a perfect world, if things were to play out as they should, all parents would be able to raise their children and all families, they would all stay together. But that isn't the story. Instead, it's a story of redemption, of restoration and of healing. But those things, redemption, restoration, and healing, they're only possible and they're only needed if first there is brokenness. You read it to us like a thousand times. He gnashed his terrible teeth and he roared his terrible roar. I always liked this one. Oh, Ferdinand. Me too. Michael, your mom ever read either one of those books to you?
Michael, who was that boy you were talking to at the restaurant? Marcus. Marcus, and he, he works there? Yeah. How do you know him? He's my brother. Well, we'd really, we'd really like to meet him someday. Would that be okay with you? I don't know where he stays. When was the last time you saw him? I was little, maybe. Just like in this scene, our adoption story isn't one where God swoops in and takes away our pain and he takes away our past. He doesn't remove the hurt or the struggle. <laughs> Instead, he enters it with us. He sits with us in it. He slowly begins to apply his healing balm to the places where we're bleeding out. There will be scars, but they will serve as a reminder of his great love for us. It's actually the reason he came to begin with. Jesus entered the scene to heal the sick, to love the poor, to offer redemption for all of mankind. As a woman who was adopted <laughs> and as a mother who has adopted a beautiful little girl who is spunky and sassy and wild and fiercely loved, I can honestly tell you that adoption isn't easy. In fact, it's really hard. And we should probably say that more often because you know there's no real easy way to erase the wounds that come from being removed from a biological family. God created family to be connected and to be whole. <laughs> It's a spiritual connection. And when it's broken, there's immense pain. And there's no way to erase memories or trauma or scars or the really hard parts of our stories that we want to keep hidden. But God, <laughs> he promises to be close to the brokenhearted. He promises to put bandages on our wounds. He promises to turn the ashes of our lives into something really beautiful. Adoption screams, I love you. It whispers, I choose you. It calls us by our rightful name, our new name. We find the healer of our wounds. We experience a God who loves us and chooses us and claims us as his own even when we're bleeding. Adoption is beautiful and it's messy. It's redemptive and it's our story. So the question is, what would happen if we believed this? What would we do next? I think it's difficult to talk, to talk about our adoption without acknowledging that God is probably calling some of us to adopt. He's calling some of us to become foster parents. I don't believe that we're all called or able even to, to welcome hurting children into our lives, but I do believe he's calling some of us to do that. And so maybe your next step is to pray about how God is calling you to care for hurting children. There are some next steps that we should all take. And the first is that we should live lives of praise and worship. <laughs> Our adoption should cause us to praise, to shout it from the rooftops. God should be praised because he loves you, because he welcomes you. He claims you as his own. He gives us, me, you, the lost, the broken, and the hopeless, a seat at his table, and he rewrites our story. He is more than worthy of our praise. Our hearts should be filled with joy and filled with hope, and praise should fall from our lips because of that. Praise him. Thank him every single day. And our adoption should cause us to love people and to serve people. How could it not? <laughs> adoption changes us. Love changes us. And we should want to share it. We should take care of orphans and widows. And we should take care of our neighbors and our own families and the people in our church and the people we work with. You know what? We should serve in our church. <laughs> in fact, you should serve in Riverbank Kids or Riverbank Students because we get to tell the future generation the truth about who God is, the truth about who they are. You should join the greet team so that you can call people by their name, their right name, and help them to feel welcome into God's family. You should join a serve team here at Riverbank because your life has been forever changed by your own adoption into God's family. You're not who you used to be. You've been given an incredible gift that you don't deserve. We don't have to serve. We can't help but serve. 
We don't begrudgingly go out of our way to love people. We can't help it. (laughs) It just flows from us. And so the rescue mission continues. So every single person in our community hears the story of Jesus and the way he loves us and the way he calls us his own. That's what we should all do next. Those are our next steps. We should live lives with praise and worship on our lips. And we should love and serve people. I pray that you always remember your own adoption story, that you never forget it. I pray that you remember the crazy, extraordinary, radical love that God showed you through Jesus. And I pray that if you truly know this love, if you allow this love to grip your soul, if you anchor your identity to this love, I pray that you will live differently and love extravagantly because of it. Let's pray. God, thank you so much uh, for calling us your own. Um, Thank you for naming us. Thank you for loving us. And thank you for rewriting our stories. I pray, God, that you will just let us uh, rest in that truth, that you'll let that settle in on us, and that we'll identify as children of God. Help us to love other people well. Help us to serve other people well. And help us never to forget everything that you have done for us. We love you so much, and I ask all this in your name. Amen. That's an incredible movie, right? Have any of you seen the whole thing? I have. I cried when I watched that movie, um, and then I cried earlier today in the office when I watched that message, and then again tonight, and so um, I didn't think you would get me. I didn't think it was going to happen, but it did, and I feel I'm not ashamed, actually. It was just a really good movie. I, I, I think that the heartbeat of this whole message is so remarkable. And for those of you who are here, and maybe you said yes to a relationship with Jesus, we need to know whose we are, and we need to make certain that we dial up God's voice in our lives. In this movie, it was about a guy, and and, and his story is he became a professional football player, right? And I was thinking about that. It's really remarkable because there's a whole playbook that that team has, and that playbook helps them know how to react in certain circumstances and to position themselves so they're where they need to be, when they need to be there. And I think for us Christians, if you're here, you need to read the playbook. We have God's written word. That's our playbook, and it helps us navigate everything life will throw at us. So please understand the importance of the playbook. Spend some time in it. Sit in God's presence and remember that you were chosen and that you were adopted and that God loved you so much to do some crazy things to capture your heart and to rescue you from darkness. And you're here and you're wondering why we're talking about adoption and, 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 and what God did. And you heard the name Jesus and maybe you've never understood or been told who Jesus is and why it actually matters. And here is what we know. Uh, when we read the Bible, Jesus is God. He sent his son, God, into the world. That's Jesus, right? He entered the world. He's perfect. And the reason he did this is that he understood that there was something he had to do, a problem that only he could solve. And the problem that only he could solve is the brokenness. It's what's called sin. It's missing the mark. It's imperfection. And the reality is that myself included, every person who's ever existed, we've missed the mark. We've fallen short in some way or in something. And oftentimes, if you're like me, your response in your own is to try and make things right again. But I've ended up hurting people more deeply in my own strength, trying to make things right. And then Jesus had to enter the scene. He had to address the sin problem and he really had to do this because sin will separate us forever from God. God exists in a literal place called heaven. He wants all of us to be there. But if we don't say yes to a relationship with God, then he's not gonna force us to be with him forever in a literal place called heaven. So there's a place reserved for people who have not said yes to a relationship with Jesus. It's called hell and God doesn't send people there. We choose it by failing to receive and to choose God. is the presence of God. That's what makes heaven heaven. Without God, heaven wouldn't be as glorious as it is and as incredible as it will be. So if you're here, I want you to understand that God crossed eternity for you. He left perfection and he entered in this messed up world that we kind of ruined and sin that we brought into the world. And he surrendered his life as a sacrifice for our sins. He died for us. And all you have to do is call on the name of Jesus and you will be saved. 
In John 3, 16, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. It's simple. And I think sometimes we complicate it. So we're here right now. And if you've never said yes to a relationship with Jesus and you just don't know what to do about your brokenness and you're trying as hard as you can to erase it or to make it look a little bit more polished so that people maybe just don't notice, I think that if you're honest, you're not fooling yourself. You're probably not fooling other people and God knows exactly what you're doing. And he just wants you to stop trying to be a great person and embrace the fact that he surrendered his life for you so you don't have to be a great person because he was perfection and he was a sacrifice for your sins. So I hope right now, that right now, today, tonight, we can begin a relationship with Jesus. And if you are here, you've never said yes to a relationship with Jesus, this is your opportunity. And I want everyone in the room to close their eyes. I'm gonna count to three. And when I get to three, if you want to begin a relationship with Jesus for the first time, I'll give you the opportunity to do that by inviting you to just throw your hand up. So one, for all have sinned and fallen short of God and his glory, every person in existence. We have missed the mark, we have made mistakes, but that imperfection has a very real consequence. It will separate you forever in a literal place called hell. If you don't surrender it to God by inviting Jesus into your life and casting the weight of your sin on his shoulders. So two, and Jesus says that he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one will go to the Father who is in heaven except through him. He also says in Romans 10, 9, that if we, can, uh, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, um, we will be saved. And so if you're here right now, and you've never said yes to a relationship with Jesus, you don't know where you would go if you died tonight. You can go home knowing where you'll know. You can address the sin issue in your life by surrendering the weight of sin to Jesus. And three, today is the day of salvation. If you wanna say yes to forgiveness of sins, yes to eternity in a very real place called heaven, yes to a relationship with Jesus for the first time, I just invite you to raise your hand so we can see it. All right, let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you're here. And we just acknowledge that. And I pray that you would meet us in the moments that we continue to have together and to share together. And I ask also that there would be some things uh, in the message that we just really process um, as, we, as we leave here. I, I pray that you would help us to just really dive deep in them. And I pray that we would genuinely be changed and transformed because of you. We love you. In your name we pray and yours alone. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that this message has encouraged you and challenged you to grow in your walk with God. And if you wanna stay up to date on new messages every week, be sure to subscribe to our channel to be notified anytime we put up a new video. Here at Riverbank, we're on a rescue mission to reach people with the message of Jesus. And if you would like to partner with us, you can go to riverbankchurch.com give or click the giving link in the description. We love you and we are praying for you. We will see you next week.